successful coach in Martin Rennie. So, Martin, um, thank you for coming on the show. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. No worries. So, um, you know, you grew up in Scotland and, you know, always had a love for the game and everything. You were a ball boy, actually, for Falkirk uh, FC. So, like, what was that kind of experience like as a kid, always being in that professional environment? Yeah, that was really fun, actually. Um, when, I, when I was a ball boy, I was probably about 12 years old. Um, and so it was just really fun to be around, like, professional players and be around the game. And I remember um, at that time, Falkirk were in the Premier League, so they had a small stadium, um, but it was really like quite often quite full um, because Rangers would come and Celtic would come, Parks and Hebses were big clubs. Um, and so I remember being there and seeing like some really big crowds, good atmospheres. And um, I remember in one game in particular, there was... Uh, Graham Souness, who was a famous uh, coach in Scotland, he'd been a famous player as well. He was a manager of Rangers now, and they had a lot of really high-profile players. And um, I was the ball boy, and I was like up close to them. Like they, their locker room was right beside where we 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 were, you know, coming out of. So we were around all the like the captain of England, Terry Butcher, the one of the goalkeepers for England, with Chris Woods, top Scottish players like David Cooper and Ali McCoy. So it was really fun and. Uh, yeah, one of the really fun things about it was that me and my friend figured out that when the warm-up finished, the players and everyone would go into the locker room, and um, if we just kept a ball, which we could easily do, then he and I could go onto the field and we could shoot on each other in the goal in front of the whole crowd and nobody would ever say anything, so that was really fun. Uh, so, I mean, it's actually quite interesting because uh, I was in looking up, you know, the Scottish League the other day and they actually just announced champions in Celtic. So, um, I was actually looking up Falkirk and, you know, next thing you know, I'm, you know, researching everything here and uh, I was like, oh, so he, you know, was in it. So, um, go to university over in Scotland and then at the very end of that, you get off with a trial to the Charlotte Eagles over here in, you know, the States. So, like, how did that opportunity really come about? Uh, so that came about mainly because um, in 1994, I came over to the U.S. when the World Cup was on. Um, and I actually um, did some soccer camps and played some games and I got to know some people. And I got offered to do a scholarship in college over here, but I was already at university in Scotland and I wasn't going to really change or move at that point. But the same person then became, I think, the coach or the general manager of the Charlotte Eagles. And so... A few months later, invited me over to play for the team, and yeah, that was that was a really fun experience. Yeah, and so you know, you play with the team, but then you eventually get injured. Some you know around that time. So, well, like, how did you mentally, you know, stay tough, kind of throughout that time being injured, you know, in a different, completely different country? Yeah, that was quite tough. It was actually right at the beginning, on the very first day, um, I I got injured. I tore my ACL, so that was. Um, that was quite difficult, uh, especially like to say being far away from home, not having family or, or close friends nearby. Um, but I got to know people um, and they were really nice to me, the people in Charlotte who took really good care of me. Um, and I met, I ended up meeting a girl who's now my wife. So it ended up being a really good, good time in the end. But at the time it was quite difficult. Um, and it probably um, shaped my coaching career a little bit because I learned a lot about myself and I learned a lot about and entry disappointments, and I think that's helped me as a coach later in life. Yeah, and so, you know, we're talking about coaching, so, you know, you go back to Scotland, and then you play for a few clubs, but, I mean, the main thing is you get that UEFA A license by the time you're 26 years old. So, like, describe that process of getting, you know, one of the most prestigious, you know, coaching licenses, if not the most, in the whole world. Well, so when I was back home playing, um, I, I was also working in business, and I learned a lot of things about um goal setting and like confidence and men mental strength, things that I didn't really know when I was um, younger, but things that were really helpful to me. And so when I was working, I, I kind of, uh, I really enjoyed the, the job that I had. It was in sales and marketing and I had a lot of, um, it went well, I had a lot of success. And so I started thinking about what would I like to do if I could do anything I wanted to do. And I decided like I'd like to be a, to be a coach if I could. And so I started setting goals to think about how I could become a coach. And what I learned to do was like to work backwards. So if, let's say if I wanted to be a coach when I was 30, what would be the qualifications I would need? Um, what would be the network I would need to have? 
Um, how could I put all these things in place? And so I just started working and I started working from the lowest coaching badge, which was like you you just had to turn up for the weekend and you got the, you got the certificate all the way up to the UEFA A license, which took two years and was really, really hard to get. Um, and so it was a great experience. I was around like some of the best coaches and players um, in not only in Scotland, but in the United Kingdom. And I learned so much. Like, for example, one of my coach, one of my mentors was David Moyes, who was the coach mm. of Everton at the time, who became the coach of Manchester yeah. United and has had an amazing career. And then people that were in my group were some of the most talented Scottish players who played on the national team. People like uh, John Collins and Ali McCoy and people like that who were very famous in Scotland. And so I learned a lot from the coaches who were mentoring us and also from the other um, players or, or the other candidates. So I felt like I learned a lot and uh, it really gave me a lot of confidence in my ability to coach. And getting that UEFA license was a really big, uh, big thing to do because um, it mainly in Scotland, it only really went to the high profile players. It didn't really go to people who were less known as, as professional players. So it was a big achievement and uh, it kind of was part of my um part of my process to becoming a coach later and, and that's kind of what I did at 30 years old I retired from doing business and I became a coach which was kind of my ambition but also it was like my hobby it was the thing I really liked doing um, and I and I started doing it kind of just for fun and then it thankfully went went really well and I'm still doing it you know all these years later yes I mean you go to Africa you know for like charity um you know a team so like what was that really about, like, that whole charity thing? And, you know, what was that experience like, not just as a person, but, you know, excuse me, not just as, you know, a coach, but a person? Because, you know, you got to learn a lot, you know, being in a completely different continent. Yeah, no, you've done your research. It's really good. Um, so, uh, yeah, I went on this trip to Sudan with some friends of mine who were going there to do, like, humanitarian work with um, children who were in orphanages and underprivileged kids. And basically, we went to three places. We went to Mozambique, South Africa, and Sudan. And Sudan was like quite a dangerous place to go because it was um, it was on the UN blacklist at the time, and it had eight different borders around the country. Now you've got North Sudan and South Sudan, but at the time it was just one country. And it was it was soon after um, the terrorist attack that happened in the US on 9/11. So it was a dangerous place because they think that a lot of the terrorists in the world were living in Sudan because they could come in and out of the country really easily because there was eight borders and they weren't really well policed. So we had a chance to go there and play against the Sudanese national team um, and play the game there in the national stadium. In fact, I think it was about 20,000 people in the stadium and it was also on TV. And we were doing it as a way to try and um, shed light on how things were in Sudan and also try and help it so that they might get off the UN blacklist. And after we were there, they actually signed a peace treaty, a peace treaty um, which allowed them to start re-engaging with other countries and actually improve, improve the situation in Sudan. It's still a volatile country, but we did felt like we had a positive impact on, on that country at the time. It was really fascinating because not many um, people from the Western world have ever been to Khartoum, which is the capital city of Sudan or you know, northern Sudan. Yeah. And we saw like so many things there, like different museums and galleries and places that people from the West have never really seen. So it was a really amazing experience. And it kind of made me think like, what do I want to do with my life? Do I really want to go back to, to work and to, to doing what I was doing before? Or do I want to try and do what I'm really passionate about, which I really like soccer and I like being around coaching and helping people and so I decided like that was the route I wanted to, to really follow. And I mean it's safe to say you made a good decision in there so uh, you know you go to Oregon so you go back to a different country you know in a country you've been before America to coach for the Cascade Surge of the PDL now USOB2 so like I mean how you know why did you make that decision to go back to America you know was that like the only opportunity did you have other opportunities like what was that? Yes, that, so really that was what I thought the best opportunity because when I got my UEFA license, I did get some opportunities to um, become a youth coach at some big clubs in Scotland and also to maybe work for the National Association, the Scottish Football Association. But I didn't really want to work with youth and I didn't really want to work in, in just in the community. I wanted to try and coach high-level high players or professional players. And so I got the chance to go to Oregon and do that. 
And that was a really great experience. I went there and it was like all summer long and the players were already recruited. I just had to coach them. And it was really fun because all the ideas that I had had for maybe five, six years of, of practicing coaching and leadership and communicating, I got the chance to put it into practice. And it, it went really well and I really enjoyed it. And it kind of gave me the confidence that I could uh, do the job more in the future um, and kind of gave me that bug to do it. We won a lot of games. We had a lot of good players. Um, and so it was a really positive experience for me that led me kind of into more coaching later. Mm-hmm. And so uh, you get your first professional coaching gig the next you know season over with the Cleveland City Stars, and uh, you lose one game in your first season. So, you know, very successful. So, like, what were the tactics like kind of that season? Like, you know, I know mentally we talked about this before, you know, goal setting, like, how, what were the goals for that season, and, you know, did you exceed them? Because, I mean, one loss is, you know, crazy. Yeah, well, I think one of the big things that I've learned in business was, like, so much to do with your mindset and your mentality. So, obviously, coming into a, with a brand-new team um, and, like, quite a small budget, like, like, nobody expected us to do that well in the first year or even maybe after that. But what I've learned is that how you – how you perceive things and how you expect things to be will have a big impact on the success that you could have. And as a coach, one of my main jobs is to try and help other people believe in it. So I, I was like really full of confidence and expectation and hopefully help you pass that on to the um, And, and we, we, that was just like really hungry players, players who, who were there because they loved soccer. They weren't getting too much money, but they also wanted to hire them in here. So we kind of used that as a um, an incentive or a motivation for them to do well and to train hard. And so we were a team that was well organized and, and um, we probably lacked a striker at that time. A lot of the goals we scored were from midfielders and things like that. So but for our first year, we were maybe a few players short of what we needed, but we hardly lost any goals. I think in an entire season, we only lost like 11 13 or 12 goals. goals. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So it was really, really good defensively. Um, and we had quite a lot of possession, and we won a lot of games 1-0. And the one game that we lost, actually, was unfair because um, we scored a goal to equalise, and it was a perfectly good goal, and it got disallowed. Mm-hmm. So that was the only game that we lost, and it was in, in those days in the USL, you sometimes played on a Friday and a Saturday, and the team that you played on a Saturday was usually resting on the Friday. So we did that that game. It was against Charlotte, and that was the only game we lost. We had to travel to Wilmington, North Carolina. Through the night, we traveled to Charlotte. We rested that day, and then we played them, and they were completely fresh, and they were a good team. And that was the only game we lost. Um, and like I say, I don't think we deserve to lose that game. I still remember it quite well. Um, but that was a really good, good first season for an expansion mm-hmm. team. And so, I mean, you know, you're in the USL right now. So, like, the USL has come far away since, you know, when you really started, which, to be fair, wasn't quite long ago, you know, knowing how long the history of soccer is. So, like, you know, for you, like, how have you witnessed the USL grow? Like, how, you know, how has it grown in your time? Yeah, that's totally true. It's changed a lot. I think the standard has increased significantly. I think that the budgets have improved. Um, I think that one of the things that's happened as well is, like, Major League Soccer has gotten higher and higher. And so some players that were previously, you know, solid players on MLS teams are now kind of pushed down to the USL. So that's in, that's raised the level in the USL. And um, there's more and more foreign players in MLS. And so a lot of really, really good players are now playing in the USL. Um, I think that um, just overall, like, coaching methodology and infrastructure facilities have all improved. And then the fact that the season's a lot longer now so you're not playing Friday, Saturday or things like that. You the games are spread out more. Um, and just overall the standards have improved a lot. I think the crowds have increased and people have a lot of interest in it. And so clubs like Indy Eleven where we have a really great uh, foundation and where we have a lot of fans and we have a great training facility. You know the clubs like in like us are, are really a high level and there's a lot of those clubs in the USL so it's uh, it's a fun league to be coaching in. Mm. And so you know we did you know, pretty well with the Cleveland City Stars because uh, coming off that one loss season, you won the championship against the Eagles, who, you know, were the team that you guys lost to. So, uh, I mean, first off, what was it like to get that revenge on the Eagles? And how did it feel to finally win a, you know, professional championship? Yeah, I mean, I think revenge is always an interesting word because it's like you really only can where you're at now. And so, 
get back to get revenge. It was just like the excitement of playing in a championship game and and uh, getting the chance to win. And we, we by that time we had a really really good team and we felt super confident. Like even before the game, we were like really really confident. And I think that's a really important uh, trait in any sport and anything that you do is to have confidence and believe that you can do it. And we had that and we, we won the game. I think it was 2-1 in the final, but honestly, like we were way ahead of the other team and it could have been a lot more. Nothing against the other team because they were good, but just by that point in the season, we were really peaking and really playing well. So that was really fun. Um, and it opened up the door to go to the Carolina Rail Hawks um, because of the success we had in Cleveland. I got that opportunity. Yeah, and I mean, so the Rail Hawks, you know, kind of historically, you know, kind of an average, below average team, and then all of a sudden you come in, take over, and, you know, booms, you know, you guys are doing great. So, uh, you know, with the Rail Hawks, you win Coach of the Year, and, you know, you're winning all this, like, really, like, how do you, how do you as a coach kind of grow a team to get better and, you know, kind of become united? Yeah, so like if you think about Cleveland, if you, that was an expansion team, so it was quite hard to build. But then the Real Hawks were difficult because they, as you said, I don't think they'd ever made the playoffs. They were one of the, the bottom teams in the USL, but they had lots of potential, and that's what I saw when I took that position. So when you're building a team, one of the first things you have to try and do is build a culture that's that's going to help the team be successful. And I think that means getting good people who are positive, who help each other. I think a big... Um, problem in, in any sport is when people are negative and when they're like stabbing each other in the back and complaining all the time like those are things that stop teams from being successful so one of the first things was trying to find people that could help us build a good culture and then also making sure that we could find players that fit, fitted the system that we wanted to play so that we could have success uh, within that system and I think um, we managed to do that and we had three like really amazing years uh, there where we had ton, tons of success and really a lot of fun yeah, and I mean, so, you know, 14 goals, uh, excuse me, 14 goals against, and, you know, 54 goals for, I mean, that, you know, the numbers don't lie. So, um, you know, from there, you go to the Vancouver Whitecaps in the MLS, you know, how did it feel for you personally to finally get that first tier professional coaching gig? Yeah, it felt really good. It was really only five years from when I started um, to get into the, the Major League Soccer and get into Vancouver, um, and... Yeah, it was it was a great opportunity and something that I really enjoyed. And I think that, you know, I'd come from like the PDL to USL, NESL, up to MLS. And so that gave me a really good understanding of the pyramid of soccer, professional soccer. I also knew a lot about college soccer. So I felt like really excited about that. I was still quite young as a coach and it was a really big job, like so much media attention, so much coverage. And yet the club was quite new in terms of its infrastructure and it was only in its second year in, in MLS. So it was like taking over the worst team in MLS, but we we managed to take them to the playoffs the next year, which I think we were the first ever Canadian team yeah. to make the MLS playoffs. Um, and then we actually improved on it the next year. And I think over the two years, we improved the club by like seven in terms of points. Um, and, and dramatically improved the goals scored and the goals against and things like that. So it was really a fun place. It's a great place to live. Amazing fans of that club. Um, and yeah, I really like it. Yeah, so I mean, you know, you mentioned the whole Canadian thing being the first team to make the playoffs and stuff. But then eventually, you know, after the 2013 season, you fall a few short of making the, a few points short of making the playoffs and you get fired. Were you kind of expecting that? Like, you know, why did that happen? No, I don't think I was necessarily expecting it because we were only nine points from first place. Uh, yeah. It was just one of those years where there was a lot of teams that played really, really well. Um, we were a bit unfortunate because in the first game of the season, we lost our captain. and um, There was a central defender called Jay Demerit. He was a, a U.S. national team player. He was one of our main players. Um, and we didn't have really a great replacement for him. We really relied on him a little bit. And so we lost a few more goals than we would have liked that season, which I'm sure cost us a few goals. A few games, rather. Sometimes we lost goals on set plays late in the game, and he was the kind of player who could be quite good at defending those. So we did miss him, um, but we also had great, great attacking players. Camilo Sambizo was the highest goal scorer in Major League Soccer that year. We really had an exciting team. We attacked a lot. We entertained a lot, and and the, the, the fans, I think, were generally quite happy with that. Um, so yeah, it was a little bit disappointing to not continue. Um, but I think in life things happen for a reason and you've got to be able to look at it and say, right, 
how can I grow? What can I learn? How could I improve? Um, and it can also invigorate you and give you like determination to go on and have more success. And that was kind of how I looked at that. But it was a great club and, and I certainly really enjoyed my time there. And so from here, you know, you make a kind of a bizarre move to go over to, you know, to South Korea, a whole other side of the world. Like, I mean, why, why did you go to South Korea? You know, what, what kind of was the appeal to the market over there for you? Yeah, well, I think that one of the important things um, in coaching, if you want to get good at it, is you have to keep coaching for like a long time. You know, recently I was watching a, 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 a series, you might have watched it called The Last Dance, and it was about yeah, Chicago it, yeah. Bulls and all yeah. the success that they, they had. That was great. Um, yeah. And yeah, it was a great, great documentary or series. And if you think about it, one of one of the reasons for their success was their coach, Phil Jackson, who not only won six championships there, but then he went on and won five more, I think, with uh, early Lakers. Yeah. And so he won 11 championships as a coach. And he didn't start coaching until he was 45 years old. In Puerto Rico. So I'm not, I'm not, I, yeah, and I'm not actually 45 yeah. yet. But I think a lot of the best coaches in the world, not all of them, but a lot of them, you look at, like, say, Alex Ferguson or, or even Coach John Wooden, also basketball. They kind of kept working on their craft. Leaving Vancouver, I wanted a different experience. I soccer in Japan and South Korea, and I really, like, I was interested in that. And I thought it would be something that would really open up my mind to a totally different way of coaching. And I decided to get my UEFA Pro license. We're starting a, a like a expansion franchise, and I was kind of quickly becoming an expert at expansion franchises because I'd done it um, twice before, and I was also really really had success. Yeah. And we were fairly new to, to experience something else and to to be a part of something kind of new and unique. So it was it was really interesting to go to a language is obviously very difficult to learn um, and so it, it was it was quite challenging but it also was like really rewarding and I feel like I learned a lot there I feel like I grew a lot as a person I feel like I grew a lot as a coach and so it had the desired effect and gave me the opportunity to uh, to come back to the US and, and have a little bit more of a settled period of time with with my family because I think being in Korea was just like hectic all the time. Yeah. And so, I mean, you mentioned a language, which was kind of a question I had was like, you know, how do you like communicate via, you know, via English or was it Korean? Like, you know, how were you learning this on the fly? I also had a translator. So, you know, I could do my best to communicate, certainly coaching the game and things like that um, with the Korean that I knew. But I had a translator with me who would also be very important and help a lot, you know, especially in deeper conversations or team talks or things like that, they would they would translate for me. But of course that was quite difficult because there's a delay, you know, once I speak then there's a delay until they speak and then some of the emphasis that I'm trying to make would probably eyes as to how to coach by saying less but maybe it's but by maybe painting more pictures by demonstrating better and by simplifying um, what we were doing. So I think it really, really helped a lot. It really makes your brain work hard and it really makes you see life differently and it also helps you understand things about yourself that you just took for granted because we, we see the world a certain way because of where we've grown up but when you see it a different way based on how other people have grown up it really is interesting. Yeah you know because you did that once before in Africa so you know you kind of did it again there and um so you come back to America to coach Indy 11 who play, you know, with the Indianapolis Colts play. So, you know, a heck of a stadium in Lucas Oil. So, uh, you know, like coming back to America, what was it like to finally really come back? It's amazing how you take certain things for granted, like being able to go to the shop or the grocery store and everything's in English and you can read it and you can find what you want and communicate with anyone in the, in the store. Sounds very simple and silly, but those types of things were not possible in Korea. So to have all of that made it feel very comfortable and, uh, you know, makes a lot of things that people think are challenging. To me, they just seem fairly easy now and fairly simple. Even, you know, we've, we've been through a lot recently with this lockdown, uh, but compared to things I had to experience in Korea, like this has been reasonably simple and straightforward. So um, I think it was just really fun to come to a place like ND11 where, the team hadn't had a great season the year before, um, but they had, again, the club just had so much potential. But a really amazing training ground, a great fan base, a really nice stadium to play in, ambition to continue to develop and grow. 
So just really a good place to come at the right time, I think. Yeah, and, you know, lastly, kind of to wrap this all up, like in quarantine, you know, how have you kind of been communicating with your team and the players, and especially new guys who aren't really familiar with the squad yet? Like, how have you really been, you know, trying to get your points across so far? Yeah, well, obviously we had a whole preseason before uh, this happened, and then we actually had one game. So we had worked on a lot of things tactically and a lot of team building exercises to help the players know each other. A lot of the players have been here before, so we do have a good new place of the team. Um, but of course, there are some new players, so we wanted to try and help them integrate into the group as well. What we didn't want to do was like um, overkill with like lots and lots and lots of Zoom meetings, every needless uh, calls. But we've, we've kind of um, given the players workouts to follow that they have to follow on their own or if they, with, if they have a roommate, they do some things with the roommate. Um, and at the same time, um, we've done some Zoom calls where we've done workouts and things together. Uh, but now we're actually able to do some small group training. So we're slowly making some progress back to, towards playing. And that's been really, really fun to see. I think the players have really enjoyed that. And I think um, that's you know given them some of that motivation back to get playing. So hopefully sometime soon we'll get back on the field. We feel like we have a really good team this year. And so we want to showcase that to everybody. Um, and if we do get back playing soon, we know that there will probably be a lot of games in a small, in a short space of time. So that could be a good opportunity for our whole squad to be involved in, in playing games. And we have a really good squad, so we think that that can, can be a fun time for us. But we know it'll be a lot of hard work and uh, we're ready to go. Yeah, and so, you know, just to put it on kind of conclusion, like, what does the game of soccer mean to you? Well, it's really like something that I've liked doing since I was a kid. I've really always had fun with soccer. Um, and so for me, it's something that I really enjoy doing and it's something where... I feel like I can um, have a positive impact on helping players improve. Also, you know, supporting them where they need support. It also gives me a chance to, to do good things in the community, to get to know the fans and to help support other organizations, youth programs and, and uh, you know, programs in urban areas and charities and things like that. So it's really a good mix for me of things that I, I like doing. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that's important in life is trying to find something that you like to do that makes it feel like you're putting in lots of time and lots of hours but it doesn't necessarily feel like a job like I, i'm assuming you know you like doing interviews and you like interviewing people so it doesn't really feel like too much work for you maybe to do the research and to get ready because it's something that you get energy from and that you have fun with and that's what soccer is like for me so i'm really fortunate that i get to do a job that i really like but I think that sometimes in professional soccer or other sports, the players and the coaches don't enjoy it enough. They feel pressure all the time. They feel stress all the time. And so a big part of what I, I want to do with my career is enjoy it and have fun with it. And also at the same time, do my absolute best to have success with it. So I'm really thankful to, that I made the decision to start coaching. I'm really happy that I've got to take it as far as I have and to keep, keep doing it. Um, but I have ambition to keep going higher and I think as I get more experienced and as I spend more time around the game I think I am improving as a coach and that's something that can help me continue to move on with it and continue to have fun with it and, and really trying to keep at the forefront that like if I was doing anything I wanted to do this would be it and so that that's to me is a big big positive and a big win. Yeah, I mean, that's just great, you know, really amazing. And uh, I just thank you for your time, Martin. You know, it's been a pleasure talking to you, everybody. So um, I'm Chris Daly from the Sports Court, joined here by Martin Rennie and um, signing off. So I'll see you guys later.